You see, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, the historical fact, much more, here is the superlative of our faith, this is the dynamic that makes the Christian life a working proposition. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be as a continuing process saved by his life. So we have to add a second statement. The first is the life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. But here is the second. The death that he died qualifies you to receive the life that he lived. That's the genius of the gospel. This is what, put, this is what puts heart into it. The life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. But the death that he died qualifies you as a forgiven, redeemed sinner, acquitted on a holy basis to become the recipient again, now in the present tense, of the life that he lived then, 1900 years ago. So we discover that the life that he lived then can only condemn him. But isn't this thrilling? It's the life that he lives now in you that saves you. And the Christian life is the life that he lived then. Live now by him in you. Because he is the only person capable of living that kind of life. This is the good news of the gospel. Faithful is he that calleth you. Come unto me. He'll do it. He is himself the dynamic of every demand he ever makes upon the redeemed sin. It is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Christ in you. The hope of glory. The only hope. Christ liveth in me. The source of all his own divine activity and the origin of his own image. This was his hour. For except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains and it lives on and on and on forever. Eternally lonely. But what happens when a grain of wheat goes into the ground and dies? Through death there is the release of life. And it isn't long before a new corn is fashioning. And beneath blue skies and the warm rays of the sun, the golden swaying field of a ripened heart. Every golden field of corn is a graveyard. And bursting through from death. And in that new opening ear of corn, thirty, sixty, a hundredfold, <clears throat> the light, the same light, the light germ there, life has been imparted into the heart of every new grain through the death of the original. That's why the Lord Jesus died. He said, I am come that you might have life. This is what baffled the disciples, of course, for the three years in which the Lord Jesus taught them. They just couldn't grasp it. Why should he stubbornly set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem? Why stick your neck out? Why deliberately go into the lion's den? They just couldn't see the point. Until after that appearance of the Lord Jesus, subsequent to his resurrection, he showed them his hands and his feet. And he began to unfold the scriptures in such a way that at last their understandings were enlightened. Now he says you're going to see the point of it all. It left you baffled and bewildered, disillusioned and afraid. Now, you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And as a result of the life I live, which qualified me for the death I have already died, you now are going to be qualified to receive by my indwelling Holy Spirit the very life I live. So that the things that I did you will do and greater works than these. Because you are going to be added to my new corporate body on earth and the life that I have lived clothed with the sinless humanity that my father fashioned for me in the womb of Mary. This... New 
body my father is going to present to me? A corporate body. Having been with you, I'm going to be in you. I will not leave you comfort. You will receive power from on high. And the power that you will receive from on high will be nothing less than my presence. I will come to you. And live in you. And Peter, you're going to become my lips. And John, you're going to become my hands. As members of my new body, each individually added to the other in the corporate hall under my headship, possessing my life, I am going to continue to do and to teach the things that I began to do and to teach in my own humanity, in your humanity. And you know as well as I do that the Acts of the Apostles is the continuation of what Jesus began to do and to teach. The only difference was that he now did it in terms of that redeemed humanity that having been reconciled to God was now re-inhabited by God, for God. And the first ripened golden ear of corn was 120 grains strong. As on that first day of Pentecost, 120 men and women received no body less than Christ himself. As he presenced himself within them through the eternal spirit, as the Father for 33 years had presenced himself in the Son for 33 years through the eternal spirit. So that as the Father was in the Son, now the Son was in them. But as the Father had sent him, now he was going to send them. That his life in them might go on reproducing all down the ages. The hour is come. Now you can see what a wonderfully rich gospel it is we have to preach. You never invite anybody to come just for it, forgiveness. You never invite anybody to come to Jesus just to get to heaven. There's only one valid reason why you and I should ever invite any man, woman, boy or girl to come to the Lord Jesus, and that is for the Lord Jesus. That he himself might step into their humanity and fill them with himself, so that their bodies might become temples of the living God. So that they might literally baptize by the Holy Spirit into his body, they might become living members individually of his corporate body in general. And that is why you see every genuinely spiritual church is an evangelizing entity. For the Lord Jesus is the one who came to seek and to save that which is lost and given right away in any individual member, however humble, however young. He will be about his ancient business in and through every single living healthy member of that body. The total church evangelizing a lost world. Jesus Christ in action. Jesus Christ in business. But just a minute. If there was an hour for him that his life might be reproduced in others. And that life has been reproduced in you and me. There must be an hour in your life and mine if that divinely imparted germ is to reproduce in us. That's the rock. Not only a cross on the hill, but a cross in the heart for every believer. That the latent lordship of his divinely imparted life might be released to the world around. For remember this, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains. Just one grain never becomes more but lives by itself alone. And it is possible for you and for me to be spiritually regenerate on the grounds of redemption and receive nothing less than the very life of the risen Lord himself and for that life to be endungeoned within our human spirits never to find its way into activity through our souls never to be released in terms of behavior, action and quest.